and mythologise our current age may require some serious reassessment. And I propose that there are alternative ways of thinking more appropriate for understanding and perhaps even living through this age. There are, though, a couple of assumptions at work here, and I want to just kind of lay my assumptions out quite quickly. Um, first, I'll just remember to click on. First, I assume that we are indeed living in turbulent, catastrophic, or perhaps even apocalyptic times. Everyone here can probably generate their own litanies of crisis and despair to populate this period. The climatological, global warming, extreme weather events, weather weirding, but also ocean acidification, melting ice caps and rising tides, deforestation, habitat loss and the sixth mass extinction, environmental degradation, pollution and toxification, resource depletion and scarcity, peak oil, peak water, peak everything, resurgent nationalisms, militarisms, terrorisms, the list goes on. Second, I assume that we are living in a world of more than human systems, networks and assemblages. The world is composed and comprised of numerous complex systems of materialities, information and energy. Now, this is probably not too contentious a claim at first blush, but it may become more so as I proceed with this talk. And I will point many of you here towards a wealth of philosophical material that has been concerned with theorising and conceptualising the organisation and complexity of the world in other than human terms. The works of Giles Deleuze and Felix Guattari, uh, Manuel de Landa particularly, Bruno Latour, Jane Bennett, uh, the new materialists, the speculative realists, the object-oriented ontologists. These are all valuable introductions to these ideas of a more than human world. And their metaphysical ideas are very much in the background of my talk today and I can talk to them more later if you want to but I'm just kind of putting them out there as kind of part of my kind of world view. <clears throat> now taken together the aforementioned assertions of a world of multiple crises and a world of complex systems provides a very useful point of entry to the question of naming and framing our age. Now, the popular terminology here is Crutzen and Sturmer's The Anthropocene, uh, a term we can date back to about 2000, and you know, we're all familiar with it now, it's in the popular press, it's everywhere. This is the age in which humanity have become a geological force, an agent of change. There are, though, alternatives, a whole raft of them all of which attempt to capture certain salient features of this period. And you may have your own favourites. I'll give you a few. Uh, Jason Moore's Capitalocene, Norgard's Econocene, McBrien's, I like this one, Necrocene, uh, Derek Jensen's Sociopocene, Hornberg's Technocene, uh, Donna Haraway's recent Fulucene, uh, and I take my point of departure from Haraway, actually, I disagree. There's another paper where I disagree with uh, Haraway's term and uh, go in a different direction. Uh, it's becoming a long list, and it's, a variable, it's a, really a veritable Rorschach test of narratives, methodologies, and theories for making sense of our age. So, <clears throat> my aim today is to unapologetically... <laughs> add to this embarrassment of riches. The theorising, narrating and naming of our current moment in history with sustained attention to ecological and planetary impacts and forces is a necessary and vital activity. And this is particularly so when our current concepts and narratives are proving woefully inadequate to the task of engaging with the wickedly complex problems and existential dilemmas of our time. Alex Evans has recently asked, what can we do when evidence and the arguments aren't enough to affect behaviour 
and address crises such as global warming? His answer, we need to engage with the mythic imagination. We are suffering, he says, from a myth gap, and that's the title of his recent book, and need to find new ways of narrating our situation in an ecologically responsive manner. Similarly, Paul Kingsnorth has speculated as to whether some of our well-worn narratives of environmentalism may not be working. As he's asked, what if it isn't a battle or a war to save the earth? What then? Perhaps another mythic narrative is needed. New stories and conceptual frames may be required. Now, uh, the mythic narrative and conceptual frame that I want to propose comes from an unusual source. The writings of H.P. Lovecraft. Now, some of you may be familiar with this, but for those of you who don't know, Lovecraft was a writer of weird fiction and horror short stories and, and novellas in the 1920s. He articulated a mythos and a universe of inhuman forces where barely comprehensible alien agencies and elder gods, such as Cthulhu, interacted with humanity, often only tangentially, and whose true natures and purposes were capable of, capable of severely challenging human cognition, sanity and existence. His contribution to popular culture is particularly significant in this regard, in regards to this delineation of immense alien horrors existing on the very fringes of human awareness and understanding. Why then Lovecraft? How might the evocation of a 1920s pulp horror writer have any application to our current ecological crises or a gap in our mythic imagination? So, my proposal is that we do in fact inhabit a more than human world of monstrous agencies, tolling of the bell, <laughs> indeed. So we do inhabit a world of more than human agencies, analogous to Lovecraft's powers and aliens. That is, there are alien powers already here, living alongside us, around us, within us, and through us. The world, sorry, I should have danced. The world is populated by a multitude of non-human systems and agencies that fit the descriptor of Lovecraftian monsters and the term the Cthulhu scene remarkably well. And I've just got on the slide actually, you know, I'm talking about Cthulhu rather than Thulhu. Well, that's kind of Haraway's term and there is, there is kind of a difference, but uh, I can maybe refer, maybe it seems very small, look at the spelling. <laughs> But when Haraway talks about this, Haraway's talking about um, earthly powers. She's evoking the kind of uh, the Greek thonic of the earth, the underworld. But this is a little bit different from Love. Well, it's very different from Lovecraft. Um, so the world is populated by a multitude of non-human systems and agencies that fit this term much better. But to name but a few of these, one might point towards nation states, multinational corporations media networks, financial markets, institutions, whether religious, political, legal, social, cities, and even algorithms. But they also include ecosystems, Gaia, maybe. Each of these things is an emergent system, an actor, an agentival assemblage in its own right. Their origins may in part be human, not always, they may be partially composed of humans, but they have long since escaped human control, human dependency, or even human comprehension in some cases. We can affect them, we are affected by them, but we are not they. So while we tend to fixate on human agency and much prefer to reduce the world to the human, this is just an evolutionary feature or a hangover uh, one of many evolved cognitive biases, filters and mechanisms we have. But it's quite understandable. It's also a 
Crucially, it's also a partial explanation of why we are failing to address the climatological and ecological crises of our age. Most of these crises and problems are systemic. They are the product of immensely complex, more than human assemblages and these emergent systems. They lack, or more, accurate, more accurately transcend, human intention, control and agency. We understandably focus our attentions on human personalities, their motives, their values and their many vices. You can probably put in your own names there, uh, <laughs> avoid naming particular politicians. Uh, but without clearly recognising that these are shaped, enabled and affected by much larger systems and agencies whose logics and principles are not our own. So I'm not, I'm not arguing here that there are the, the elder gods of Lovecraft's mythos literally exist, as interesting as that might be. But rather there are, there are autonomous monstrous powers and systems that exceed and affect us in ways we barely comprehend, which certainly do exist. Indeed, some of these monstrous entities may be far more dangerous than Lovecraft's Cthulhu, Neolathotep, or Azathoth, and they may be similarly inscrutable, resistant to harm, and sanity-destroying. We may interact with their followers, their creations, and their nefarious projects, but we never quite touch or know them directly. And this is not an appeal to imagination and fiction alone. I am making claims here about the kind of entities that exist. And these claims rest on metaphysical frameworks that have varying degrees of um, conceptual and theoretical elaboration and uh, precision. Now, this isn't to say they're true, but they have their own defenders. They have measures of coherence, adequacy, and applicability to the world that can be assessed evaluated and tested and argued about. These theories, though, all lend support to my claim that, no, really, there are monsters. Thus, we may prefer to think of the world, its problems and its inhabitants... I mean, the way we think about the world and its problems and, it, its, problems and its inhabitants may be very seriously askew. There may not be monsters under the bed, but they may be hiding in plain sight, or else lurking just outside our current conceptual frameworks and narratives. So, what's the benefits of the Cthulhu scene as a mythic and metaphysical narrative, or what uh, Jane Bennett calls an onto story? Firstly, it's not a myth of human exceptionalism, uh, human progress, or human supremacy. So it's, a very, it's very amenable to ecological thinking and environmental ethics. We inhabit a more than human world where human purposes are not in control of events. There is also no simple techno fix for our problems. Neither are humanity the crown of evolution or the direction bearer. And I probably ought to <laughs> flick forwards. Neither are we, are we the direction bearer of existence. Second, the Cthulhu scene is not a story that supports the idea that humanity can liberate or save the Earth. Insofar as there are conflicts, and there are conflicts, these are not ones where humanity stands separate from or above other entities as potential stewards, saviours or messiahs. At best, we are all in this together, in a radically cosmopolitan or maybe anarchic ecology of things. Let's move on a little bit. Now, the ecological philosopher Tim Morton, uh, Tim Morton's theory of a dark ecology, comes close to evoking this mythos of the Cthulhu scene. Uh, amongst his many ideas, and Morton is very good for ideas, he's like a little idea engine, not a very systematic thinker, but he generates lots of ideas, he's interesting. Uh, Morton suggests that we are like characters in noir fiction, where we come to realise that we are not the heroes, but are implicated in the villainy. However, many of the actors in the Cthulhu scene are far stranger and more monstrous than any we might fi find in noir fiction. 
the characters of, Lovecraft, of Lovecraft's horror fiction are a far better representation of our current situation. The Cthulhu scene provides an apocalyptic myth that is wholly appropriate for our age. Uh, to develop another of Morton's claims, in a sense, the apocalypse has already ha happened. Or rather, we may have already crossed the event horizon of the apocalypse, but we've not yet realised this fact. We've been living in a world of monstrous powers and agencies for much of our history. We've simply been too preoccupied with cultural nail-gazing and our own subjectivity to take note of this fact. And it's perhaps only indigenous and animist peoples who've retained a fairly developed sense of participating in a world of other than human persons. But that's kind of maybe another talk about animism. Now, if you aren't convinced, bear with me. Uh, try and imagine us as struggling to survive and flourish within a world populated by monstrous powers and agencies that we don't fully understand or control. Nations. Governments, institutions, corporations, mindless bureaucracies. These are some of the modern leviathans and monsters with whom we share this world. We rarely think of them as such, while at the same time being complicit with and enslaved by them in various, in numerous ways. It is something called civilization and its various components, extractive industries, financial markets, corporations, that it's this which is the heat engine driving global warming. A monstrous assemblage within which we live and from which we draw certain benefits. Who then, you might ask, is really in control? The attempt to grasp and articulate the complexity of this state of affairs is often to risk one's sanity. This is little different from the monstrous world and situation outlined in Lovecraft's writings. We are poorly equipped, cognitively speaking, to comprehend the more than human world we inhabit. It's too systemically complex. And also, it's too difficult to comprehend the extended timescales and materialities involved. Plus, compared to these, other, to these larger entities on whom our continued existence seems to rely, we are transitory and remarkably limited. As with Lovecraft's investigators, the struggle is one to live in a world where these immense powers operate according to imperatives and logics of their own. Sometimes there will be conflicts as these alien imperatives threaten our immediate or long-term existence. But these are really best understood in terms of survival, predation, or simply the fight for coexistence. I think I probably ought to have skipped forward a little bit. I'll skip over that. So... It may be argued that the conceiving of such things as... I'll go one forward one, actually. Here we go. Um, it may be argued that conceiving of such things as Monsanto or ExxonMobil as monstrous agentival powers is not quite right. You know, it may be disempowering, anti-humanist, uh, maybe they're just human constructs. But actually, this may be a vital step towards changing our relationship to them and affecting their behaviour in more life-affirming or simply more effective ways. They are not us. And they're not us in, except in the sense that we participate in or, and are affected by them. They follow their own codes or desires, and we certainly don't control them. The best we can do, I think, is study these strange strangers as countless animist societies have studied their wider communities and liaise with them in whatever ways are appropriate and efficacious. Now, what might follow from this, uh, I don't know, I think it's too soon to say, but it's about shifting the way we frame the world, the way we, the things we perceive as actual entities. Uh, celebration, resistance, predation, I don't know. I've used the word monster pejoratively today and the monsters of Lovecraft's mythos are often hazardous and hostile to human life maybe Exxon Mobil and Monsanto are as well um, but monsters need not necessarily be fought or slain although sometimes they need to be they can be lived alongside 
Is my relationship with a corporation, a community, a nation, a symbiotic one, a parasitic one, a mutualist one, or something else entirely? Uh, I'm not sure this warrants careful reflection. The upshot of my talk is that we inhabit not the age of humanity, the Anthropocene, but an age of monsters, the Cthulhuocene. This is an apocalyptic myth appropriate for our age of climatic upheaval. The claims may seem outlandish, maybe, but in the interest of the flourishing of our wider communities, there is a need to take account of all the agents involved. Minimally, as Isabel Stengers has very evocatively noted, entities have to be recognised as such, lest we be devoured or overpowered by them. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Questions for Paul? Chris, then. Thanks very much indeed. Just, 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 just a quick comment. Um, uh, to, to the list, you might add the subject matter of the last talk, which was apocalyptic literature which yes. is an attempt to engage the mythic imagination. And uh, uh, one of the things which only gets to the margins of biblical scholarship is the fact that uh, that language in the New Testament about the principalities and powers is exactly what you've been talking about. And yes, engaging there are, with that is, is, is really important. There are some very good papers on this on kind of techno-demonism. And there was one a few years ago very much about that very question of using principalities and demonologies as a way of talking about... Uh, technologies as agencies in the world. So yes, there are some very good papers out there doing that kind of work. Rupert, then Tristan. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Really interesting stuff. Um, I'm not sure I, I'm convinced, though. Let's focus in on the example of the corporation. So if, if we consider uh, Joel Backen's analysis of the corporation, corporations are, are psychopathic monsters that we've uh, unleashed and they're now very difficult to bring back in control. But of course Backen argues that we can bring them back into control. It is possible. It would require a serious amount of, uh, of political will. It would require doing things like revoking corporate charters mm -hmm. uh, such that the corporations then cease to exist. Now, if you can tame a monster by making it cease to exist by revoking its charter. Well, it's a bit different from the kind of monsters that we're used to thinking of, uh, I think. And I, so I, I guess I'm worried that your picture might be disempowering. Um, let's take one other uh, example of, of why the, the public limited liability corporation is not necessarily uh, an uncontrollable monster. Uh, and here I'm disagreeing with Backen. Backen says um, they have to maximize um, profit and that dictates their behavior. But actually, that's, in, that's very unclear, because what it is to maximize profit is always up for negotiation. So intelligent managements, for example, can say, I'm maximizing long-term shareholder value by pursuing strategies which will, for example, involve uh, the climate not being destroyed, or uh, by um, getting our customers to like us by convincing them that we're actually not uh, uh, monstrous. And the best way to convince people that you're not monstrous in the end is actually not to be monstrous rather than simply to employ clever PR people, which sooner or later <laughs> gives out as a stratagem. So uh, it seems to me that there, there's two ways there, one Bacanian and one uh, anti bacanian in which uh, we can um, query the claim that corporations are uh, out of control uh, uh, monsters. So I do wonder whether that might be a disempowering um, effect of your terminolo terminological proposal. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I'll try and answer both questions. The first one, in the, and the book and the film, The Corporation, yeah, there's this very good question about um, how can you fight these corporations? And yes, so, some, some countries have laws where they can be taken apart. And there's, in the film, there's this interesting case of, you know, they, I think it's California tries to actually do this to one of the corporations, and I think they fail. But I think there are, yes, there, I mean, I think legally there are ways of uh, fighting these monsters, uh, taming them, but they're, they're, monsters, they're monsters nonetheless. I mean, that's the reason for being motivated to fight them. You know, they are externalising machines which are 
creating all kinds of environmental problems and driving, you know, driving global warming. Uh, so there are clear cases when they do need to be fought, uh, and there, there are ways in which they can be tamed. It's often a case that if you bring other monsters to fight monsters, you know, you kind of bring the legal system, the institution of, you know, the legal framework to bear upon some of these monsters. So it's how we can mobilise different monsters. You know, it's like Godzilla versus Mothra. And, you know, you bring different monsters to fight some of the other monsters. The, the other question is one about, are corporations only about maximising profit? And my students often raise this question. They say, oh, yes, you know, you can look at very, you know, corporations with good practices, you know, very ecologically sound. I, I think this is where you just need kind of a, you need a typology or what I was caught at a talk a couple of weeks ago. I said you need kind of an, a bestiary of these different corporations. Uh, I think some which start to move away from the profit motive kind of become something else. You know, I, I think they're still monstrous. They're still agencies but they become close to something else. Whereas I think the corporation, I might you know, have different types of corporation, but I think they're still externalising machines. So I think you need kind of a bestiary or a, a typology of different kinds of creatures which are out there. But my claim is that the profit motive... Let Rupert, um, you're not on the, the, the microphone. We, we, we're going we're to have to terminate quickly. We've got time for one, one more question from Tristan. Okay. A uh, quick question. Um, we were just discussing this outside the tent, actually. Um, we we're discussing Thackeray's in the dust of our planet. Um, and he talks about this. And, uh, you know, so his argument, or one of the arguments, is about what this monster represents. And it represents existentialism that the planet, well, that th mm. there's no meaning. We have no meaning. And the scary part of this monster is precisely that it, you can't reason with it. It doesn't care. It doesn't care about anything, it doesn't even care about its own self interest. Right? And so the analogy here between the monster and, say, a corporation, I'm, just, I'm struggling to, to, to link those two things in the sense that the corporation is self-interested. It does have interests, mm -hmm. and it can be reasoned with. The monster, however, cannot. Did, did, did I explain that correctly? Or do you I, think I... Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I think you have to... I mean, it's, it's how you look at these different entities, what, what things exist in the world, and... I think you have to kind of do the kind of conceptual work to say, are these things really, are these things with an agency? And I don't think everything has an agency. I don't think all systems necessarily have an agency. Um, I mean, Manuel Delanda is very good on this. He's a very recent book called On Assemblage Theory. And he works through certain things which do and don't. I mean, he doesn't think capitalism does, but he thinks markets are, have got an agency, but capitalism doesn't. So I think you have to kind of do the work. And... Uh, you can kind of work out what kind of drives the the different things in the world, and I think some you can affect, I think most you can affect. You know, there's effect theory. You can affect a corporation through the profit motive, through the laws, etc. And different different entities you affect in different ways. So I mean, something like Gaia. Gaia has been affected. You know, I think you could, if you talk if you want to talk about Gaia as a an assemblage or a, a system or a holistic whole, there are ways in which that is being affected. But I think you need to look at it on a case-by-case -case scenario. But I think all things that can be affected have their own logic or, I don't know what you, code, you know, they, they follow their own codes, their own imperatives. But I think we're, very, we're not very good at actually working out what those are. You need kind of a different kind of a morphology or a, a way of working this out. Okay, we do have to move on. That's fine. Thank you yeah. very much, Paul. Thank you. <laughs>